Good afternoon. How Tableau delivers $35 million worth of quantified benefits to JOL, and that is just the beginning. Before I start, though, please ensure you give feedback at the end of the session. It really helps us to improve our presentations going forwards, uh, and it's slightly different to previous years. You have to go into the evaluation section of the app to complete it, so thank you. Apologies for those of you at the back as well. I am going to be moving around at the front, and because of my lack of height, you probably won't see me, but hopefully the audio will make up for it. So I'm Paul Chapman. I'm the Global Director of Business Intelligence and Technology for Jones Lang LaSalle. Or as my wife would say, I do a bit like Chandler Bing from Friends. What does that even mean? So if you have a quick Google of business intelligence, you, you get this come up. And if you go onto Wikipedia, the answer on Wikipedia as to what business intelligence is. Business, I have to take a deep breath for this. Business intelligence are the set of strategies, processes, applications, data, technologies, and architectures which are used to support the collection, analysis, presentation, and dissemination of business information. <laughs> right. That, that's how we all describe what we do to our loved ones, right? That's exactly how we say what we do. So I'm the Director of Business Intelligence for Jones Lang LaSalle. And who are we? We're a professional services company specializing in corporate real estate. We're a Fortune 500 company, 86,000 employees globally, 300 offices in over 80 countries. Last year we had a turnover of $8 billion in 2017, and we manage over 4.6 billion square foot of real estate. Anyway, enough about Jones Lang LaSalle, back to me. So, uh, I'm on Twitter. I tweet at cheeky underscore chappy. I also have a blog that I very occasionally write on before anyone in the front row makes a joke. Uh, so last year I presented at the, the conference on Can Tableau Really Change Your Life? And if you go onto my blog, there is a supporting blog post with the details of that session. I also teach data visualization best practices, both internally and externally. I've delivered this introductory session now to over 1,000 people. I have an almost five-year-old who, as you can see, is also a budding member of the Data Tableau community. And in January 2016, I was named an ambassador by Tableau for the work I do in the community. And I've co-led the London Tableau user group for the last six years with several members of the front row here as well. You can have a whoop if you want. <laughs> and I'm often found with this reprobate and current Zen master who's sitting in the front here, Mr. Paul Banu. So one tip I would say for everyone at conference, spend as much time as you can with the Tableau community. I've never seen quite such a passionate bunch, and nobody is quite like it in any other field that I've seen. That's why I showed the video at the start, to try and really emphasize the, the community and what you can get from it. I also co-lead the Run Data event at the Tableau conference. We start 5.30 every morning. Crazy to most, but I know for you Americans, that's a normal time for you to go out running, right? We had about 70 people running this morning. Anyone from Run Data here in the room? Ah, oh, yeah, well, there's a few up there. <laughs> okay, so let me start with some numbers. 45, that's my age. <laughs> Baby-faced, I know, that I really don't look that old. Actually, that's a picture of me at three and a half years old, which is a similar age to my daughter right now and I'm probably still the same height, and I definitely have the same amount of hair, right? <laughs> okay. So during the next 57 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through 177 slides, six Tableau dashboards, four videos, three quizzes, I can have a whoop for that, three quizzes, <laughs> and one portal. I had to put that in because the guys that built it are sitting in the front row. And I'm also going to take you through a Tableau, Tableau beta feature that's very close to my own heart. And you'll also see Tableau on the Apple Watch. Anyone seen Tableau on the Apple Watch before? A couple of people. Probably seen an old presentation of mine. <laughs> so with all that to get through, we'd better get started. So Dr. John Medina, the brain guy, says that 60-minute presentations like this one are really bad. The reason being that we only have an attention span of about 10 minutes at a time. So I'm going to try and break the presentation up into 10-minute chunks so I don't look out into the audience and see anyone having to look a little bit like this. So we've got T-shirts and prizes to give away in three Tableau quizzes using Kahoot that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, yeah, and that was a reference because we may actually have a T-shirt cannon in here as well. So, you know, just for, just for the effect. So 
we're going to start with a quiz, get you all warmed up. So if you can all go into the Kahoot app, or if you haven't got it, go on to open a web browser, go on to kahoot.it, and then as you're getting that up, I will show you what to do next. He says, if I can find my mouse. Is my mouse on that screen? Oh, it is. There we go. Okay. Just give you time to load the app. And wait for the screen to catch up. Okay. So if you go into Kahoot, either the app or Kahoot.it, it'll ask you for a pin. The pin you want is 557-4804. 557-4804. It will then ask you for a nickname, which will start to appear on the screen. And if anyone puts any naughty nicknames up, you get automatically booted out of the game. Okay? So I'd appreciate you not doing that. All right, we've got a few people playing. So there are going to be three questions. The first one gives you 20 seconds to answer, and then the subsequent ones will be 10 seconds each. And then for the first three people, we will have some prizes. It's speed-related as well, and you can accumulate points for each question that you get quick. You get uh, done in there. Okay, 80, 81, 82. People still coming in. A few more seconds, and I'll make a start. Didn't even know it could hold this many people, you know. In a quiz. Yeah, we, have, we, we use it at work and we have about 20 people turn up, so that's fine. Right, I'm going to give it five more seconds and then we're going to have to make a start. Okay, 100. Right, we're in. Okay, so three questions. The first question is, what is this mark type called in Tableau? Four responses. A polygon, a map, an area chart, or a density. And you've got a colour and a shape that should represent on your, uh, on your app or on your phone that you can select. Got 10 seconds left, 8 seconds. 60, 70, 70 answers coming through. Two seconds. <clears throat> okay, so the correct answer was that is the density mark type, which is in beta goes into release on Monday, I believe, next week. Banubi. Ah, oh. oh, this is going to look like a fix. <laughs> okay, so why are some things in Tableau desktop blue and other things green? Are they a measure of dimension, discrete or continuous, columns or rows, or filters or marks? Okay, only 10 seconds for this one. Okay, most of you got that right. It's discrete or continuous. Dan S., where's Dan? Okay, you work for JOL, it doesn't count. Okay. Okay, final question in this round. Is this image from Tableau Mobile, Tableau Visible, Tableau iPad, or Tableau on the Apple Watch? Okay, so the correct answer was that was Tableau on the Apple Watch, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Okay, so the top three people, oh, look. <laughs> Banubi at the front, okay. Uh, Paul W., where are you? Okay, Paul's over here. And Dan? Ah, right, you came third. So I've got my learned colleague over here who is going to attempt to launch some T-shirts at you. <laughs> so, um, if, so you might need to stand up to catch them as they come across, but... Yeah, not, not too high. Watch the lights. So where, where's one over here? One over there. Whoa! <laughs> Good catch. Okay. Should we just do this all day and scrap the presentation, right? Okay. All right. Dan? Where's Dan? Over there. Okay. Not quite so powerful. Oh. Okay. We can pass that one back. Let's throw one to Banubi. And... Yeah, <laughs> and Simon at the front's got some more swag for you that he'll come around and pass on to you in a minute. Okay. Uh, yeah, that'll do for now. Okay. So that's woke you all up after lunch now, right? Okay. If you've not been at one of my presentations before, they're a little bit different to the normal ones you might get at a conference. Okay. So now we're going to the proper bit. So why do we want to use data in making decisions? The world-renowned Harvard Business Review states that organizations that are in the top third of their industry making data-driven decisions are actually 5% more productive and 6% more profitable. So my team's developed a mission statement to actually help us deliver this, which I'm going to take you through now. I'll come down here to try and do that. So our team mission statement is actually made up of six elements. We have the vision, ambition, calls, values, strategic intent, and then the priorities for the year that we're in. So our team's vision is to help people see and understand their data. No one's ever heard that one before, right? 
The truth of the matter is we, we sat down in a group, we looked at how we could try and exceed and build on that, and we couldn't, so we plagiarised tableaus, and I present for them a bit so they don't really mind. But actually, the way we try and describe it is I look at bringing people and data together drives insights. If we bring tools and data together, we drive automation. And when you have insights and automation together, that drives productivity. Then look at the team's ambition. And our ambition is to be the smartest when it comes to data, insights, and technology. And we do that across four dimensions. Data is governed, data is accessible, operational efficiencies, and innovative analytical techniques. And I'll cover all this in a bit more detail shortly. Our cause is then to transform that data into actionable insights to drive performance across the account. And we have an analytical development journey that we go up, and again, I'll come through that. Our values are then to bring global experience, uh, sorry, bring global experience and best practices to bust silos and beat our joint goals, creating trust and transparency, which enables integration. So we have a scalable, measurable, enduring framework which enables that data-driven decision-making and significant productivity improvements, delivering $35 million worth of benefit over five years, of which 16 million has already been quantified, stamped, and delivered. So how do we do that? We have a strategic intent, which is four elements. It's all about improving compliance, reducing cost, increasing productivity, and driving revenue. And we can attribute the costs and benefits that we've done across each of our dimensions that we've worked through. And then we also have the priorities that we're in for the year, so the things that we're working on. And within Jones Langler Cell, we have a vision which we call the future of work, which is the, the wheel that we've got in the middle here. It's all about the human experience, digital drive, continuous innovation, underpinned by both financial performance and operational excellence. And when we describe the, the value that we add as a team, we can either do it across our four dimensions or through the inner circle of the, the future of work. So we can cut it both ways. And last year, the team delivered 9.9 .9 million of quantified benefit after costs, so taking off payroll, taking off server costs, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's our, our six pillars of how we try and deliver it. And then when we unlock that knowledge and improve productivity across our four dimensions, we have data is governed. So we make sure that data is accurate, compliant, integrated, and synchronized. Accessible, it should be easy to access that data and provide a best-in-class reporting system. Provide operating models, automation of reports, and drive alerting. And bring innovative analytical techniques. So new exciting tools, sophisticated benchmarking, and driver analytics. Leads us to data-driven decision-making. And the journey to extracting value starts with the uh, future of work will. But actually, the way I try and describe it is across two axes. We have governance and skill going up one side, and value coming across the bottom. And then we have three pillars. We start with hindsight, we move to insight, and then we finish with foresight. And as the arrow goes, that's the direction that we want to be going in, okay? You want to be moving up into that foresight area. And when you look at this and the analytical development, there are some kind of questions, performance management questions you might be looking at. So you probably start descriptive, okay? Is my timeliness uh, performance improving? Am I moving reactive work orders to preventative? What's the status of our projects? You, you might start there. Then we start to move up the journey. So we start with diagnostic. And at that point, we bring in data governance, automation, and self-service dashboards. So governance has to underpin everything, right? You have to have a single version of the truth and a golden source. You then need to automate all of your data feeds that are coming in so that you're not doing things manually. And then self-service dashboards are a good place to start because what you'll find is you've gone from a, an Excel world where people have got a dripping tap worth of information to actually having a full-on gushing flow coming through. So you give them self-service to actually help them to get into that and understand what's available. We then move up into discovery. At that point, we can start looking at comparative analysis, benchmarking, and driver analytics. Then we move into predictive, where we start looking at monitoring with some alerting and optimization. And then kind of prescriptive, which is really the holy grail, right? If you can get into prescriptive analytics, looking at monitoring with responses and automation of those tasks. So in my world, that would be uh, with the Internet of Things, light bulbs would be connected to the Internet. The light bulb would not have failed, but it would say, I'm at about 80% efficient. It looks OK to us in the room. It looks like it's working. But we know generally they'll fail at 79%. So it will send an alert to a facility manager to come and replace that now, rather than having to place a call and have someone come in, which takes more time. 
And that's all great, it's really good. And you start to get recognized for some of the great work that the team does. Except this can result in a bit of who shouts the loudest, get stuff done. It creates problems with prioritization. And we had to invent a collaborative book of work process to get us through this. And I'll take you through that now. So we started back in December, well, June 2015, December 16, back in the old school, working with Excel to just literally track the initiatives and the things that were coming through. Then, in January to December of last year, we started to evolve that. We, we developed some forms, we devo developed a demand log, and we were able to visualize that in a dashboard to kind of understand where we was at and what was going. And then the start of this year, we really took it to the next level. We had a centralized source of entering initiatives and support tickets, able to look at those from a parent-child perspective to allow um, flows to be created automatically, and then use Tableau for the demand log updates and a really simplified dashboard. So that process would really help us work hard with the business users to identify an ROI. But even with this process, it still caused us challenges. Prioritization created, but wasn't always followed, sometimes due to urgent requests that came in. Not using process for projects to be added to the pipeline. And you're probably all familiar with scope creep, right? Inconsistent views of development. So this is a famous image, right? So if someone asks you to build a dashboard, it will generally start with that. That's kind of their view of what they want from a swing. If you've got any consultants in, apologies to any consultants in the room, but that's probably what they promised you. From a documentation point of view, that's about all that got documented. <laughs> and the customer, all they really wanted was a, a tire and a bit of rope, right? But that's a real challenge and a real problem that we face or that we've been facing every day. I hope you know, that will probably resonate with you. So the ROI development is done in partnership with the business users and isn't an easy process. We will often hear, well, I don't know the ROI, but what we're going to do is going to provide benefit, right? That dashboard is going to provide benefit. I just can't tell you what that is. And I always refer back to a quote from Steve Jobs when they say that. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. And we can also find that between business lines, we have a siloed and fragmented approach. We can have an inconsistent design and user journey that isn't good. There can be a lack of consistent communication between the BI teams and the business owners. And the data architecture can be built as a one-off and not really repeatable across the business. So despite those issues, we built a dashboard which allows us to check and validate those benefits that we've been trying to go through. But with those challenges I mentioned before, we also wanted to evolve and modernize that ROI process. And what we did identify was one key issue. So when we look up here, this is telling us all the tickets that are coming in. We've had 500 support tickets and 59 initiatives. Well, that didn't really feel quite right. And when we drilled into it, actually, the support tickets were only about 5% of those. So people saying that a data feed isn't working, or can you, um, uh, can you have a look at this because it hasn't updated. The majority of those were really a change request. Can you add a filter? Can you change this line chart to a bar chart? Can you add a 3D pie chart, please? Those kind of things. So let me just switch into Tableau, and I'll just show you what that looks like. If I can control the mouse. joys of live demos. There we go. So let me just talk you through our book of work benefits. This is our latest version, okay? Uh, you'll also notice a lot of this is anonymized data because we can't actually show you the real stuff, but you get the idea with the dashboard. So this year today, we've had 1,200 tickets come in, 1,000 closed, and you can see the rate of those tickets increasing. The next three boxes now actually split down. We can see the support tickets, the change requests, and the new initiatives. The benefit over here is the quantified benefit that's been delivered year to date and what that will roll up into a four-year number. And then the 25.9 is the initiatives from this year added to year-on-year -year initiatives that we can claim and use from last year. And then what we do is if we drill into new initiatives, what we can then see is actually a pop-out container that will show us how those initiatives are broken down by our intent, so reducing cost, productivity, compliance, and revenue. And the bits that are really interesting here is from my side, we look at the owners. Who in the team, again, all made up data, is actually delivering this value? Who's getting all the work that's going in? But the really interesting one is this, the top 10 requesters. So who's coming up with really good ideas that's driving benefit to the business? How can we nurture that talent, and how can we work better with them? And then when we look at the benefit coming through by year, um, 
we can then also get a, a vision tool tip showing us those benefits broken down. Is it multi-year or single-year benefit that we've got? Okay. Drum roll. Oh. So. <laughs> So when, when I wrote this presentation and, and you came today, I said that the, the value that we were delivering was going to be 35 million over five years. Actually, that's changed since then. It's increased ever so slightly. Drum roll, please. Can anybody guess? So can anyone guess what that value has gone up to? So it was 35 million. There's a hat in it for you. 36? Oh, 45. Bit more than 45? Bit lower than 50? 48. There you go. Right. Well, well done. Well done. That really is loads of money. <laughs> the Americans in the audience now are going, what, what is this? Okay. So we, we've looked at our purpose, and we've looked at how we can try and build something to deliver it. But how do we then structure our team to support this process? So back when I started, oh sorry, back when the team was formed, the original structure back in 2014, there was only 15 heads, and the majority of those were technology-based. Actually, Shane's in the audience now, who was one of the original founding members, right, that was up there. When I joined in July 2016, the payroll for the team was over $2 million. One of the challenges I got was, you build a load of pretty dashboards, but what's the value, right? What's the so what feature, which is why we really emphasize the ROI factor. So it's a $2 million payroll, 24 heads, plus a number of dotted lines coming in. And actually, going back to when I joined, there was uh, an email that came out uh, just before I joined. So it went to Tableau, so I'm reaching out and seeing if you can put us in touch with someone in the London, UK market for sourcing a Tableau rock star. That was me. Hello. Um, uh, who can come and work with us. And that was from Bill. I don't, Bill was going to be in here, but he's not. Bill, are you in here? No? OK. So uh, that was Bill, who's my predecessor, who's now doing my role for our, our biggest competitor. Not as well, I should add, but you know, so, so be it. So I was going to buy him a drink, but we'll have to save that one for later. Anyway, so back to quarter four now, so how the team's structured today. And actually, we're evolving that even further when we look at moving into Q1 next year. The headcount on the team is actually increasing um, by about 10%, but the payroll cost is reducing by 15%. And the key parts that, we're, that I just want to emphasize down here is this box down here. This is uh, the team that's a mixture of the team in Warsaw and three members of the team from the data school in London. Now, the data school team actually, there's a couple in the front row, a couple of ex-data schoolers as well. Um, it's not a cheap resource, but actually these guys are highly, highly skilled in Tableau and Alteryx. They have a four-month training, classroom-based training session with Andy Creeble, the Zen master, wrote the big book of dashboards and does many other things that you've probably heard about. And what happens is when we get those people in, we can get some iteration done really fast and to a really, really high level. Uh, and uh, let me just go back into another demo to just show you what that looks like. Because one of the things we're always challenging, you guys are probably challenged on as well, is to bring your costs down, bring your headcount down. But actually, what people don't want, they don't really want you to bring your headcount down. They want you to bring your costs down, right? So what I try and do is have a, I've got a Sankey that tries to articulate how the team has developed over the years. So we've got the start of last year, the middle of last year, the start of this year, and kind of where we're going to be at the end of this year. So we can see the flow from the teams. There's a couple of bits in here where we used to have uh, an advanced analytics function that then we didn't need anymore because it had been set up to do what it had done, and then we moved that into Walsall. That allowed us to start developing our Generation 2 program, which is being led by James in the front row. But then the really interesting one that I can then look at is then also look at this Sankey via country. So we can then see how the shape of the team has changed as well. So where, where the resource is coming from. And just to give you an idea of, of cost, if we go and have a look at the US over here, I need to come back a bit to make it work. But yeah, if you're going to Vision Tooltip, right? So the start of last year, 54% of the team's salary was US-based, costing 1.4 or 1.5 million. If we, look at, uh, if we look at that today, that's 32%, you know, 800K. So we're moving in the right direction from a cost point of view, which is answering the, the boss's criticisms and, and requests of us, which is quite an important thing. But we are still increasing our headcount, which is what we also want to be doing as well, because we want the right headcount able to support the ROI development journey. 
So let's go back into PowerPoint. If there was a quicker way of getting into PowerPoint each time, if anyone can tell me, I would appreciate it. And there's one other thing as well. I always use a quote from Jed Bartlett when a new person wants to join our team. Margaret Mead originally said the quote, but I actually prefer um, Bartlett's uh, context. So, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Does anyone know why? It's the only thing that ever has. It's, it's a point I try and make to the team, is that we're a small group of people, but we can be felt, the impact that we make felt vastly beyond the realms of just our team, and actually we can give a lot back to both the community and the internal other teams that are providing BI. So I mentioned the data schoolers earlier, right? Uh, so they work for an EMEA-based technology Tableau consultancy company called the Information Lab. Uh, really, really good partner. We partnered with them for quite a while. And they do a really good job. However, I've obtained some secretly filmed footage of them talking about their placement with us, which I will show you now. A las 8, te llamo para que vayas a recoger las paelleras. Y me acuesto el sub, para allá para abrir el restaurante que era el arroz. Y me llama el cocinero. Risita, ¿qué? Ven por las paelleras. Venga, que a las 2 de la tarde ya están aquí. Mira, el bañador. En las chanclas. Todo despeinado porque no me dio tiempo de nada ponerme las chanclas y el bañador. Voy a la playa, ya subió la marea. <risa> So I would seriously think twice before using anyone from the data school. <laughs> but they are good. OK. So when I talk about the team, the key theme for how the team works is all about collaboration. We work out five countries, six time zones, and three quarters of their day is spent collaborating with colleagues that they've never, ever met. We use a wide range of tools. And the team has to perform to a level, working at the, as if they were working at the same bank of desks in the same office as one coherent unit to become a high-performing team with the added challenge of working independently of each other, communicating through a collaborative tool of Microsoft Teams, which is the, the channel that we use, rather than email. So ensuring that the work is measurable and the opportunities for using our framework and tool set extend far and wide. And when we think about the future, will the work we've done last or is it just transient? How do we develop the team to deliver this? So Simon Beaumont, who's in the front row, joined our team, how long? July. July. Oh, feels like a lifetime. Um, so he joined us in July. He's creating a fantastic internal community for us, encouraging innovation and allowing the team to be true visualizers, providing continuous learning, providing playtime, achieving professional recognition, and celebrating success. So he runs a Storytelling with Data monthly visualization challenge, which was based on the original by Cole Nathlick. And when we look at how people learn, the focus here is really all about informal learning that we see up in the top corner there. It's the informal learning part that's really important. So we're focused on visualization best practices, not technical expertise. So everyone gets two to three hours per month. And the themes this year so far have been an annotated line charts, colored bar charts, waffle charts, slope charts, and waterfall charts. The first challenge we had was waterfall charts. So this is a selection of the team's work that they was able to deliver. And the second challenge was annotated line charts as well. So nothing to do with work data, but all the time improving the skills of the team. So 
Well done, Simon. Thanks for that. Top work. OK. Phone's out. Gun out. Second quiz. So you all got the hang of how it works now, right? There's going to be a different quiz number that you'll have to enter, which I will bring up shortly. And because you're all old pros at this now, there is only 10 seconds per question. So your game pit is 88150097. Use the app or kahoot.it. 88150097. Naughty nicknames beware. Vanoob, can you try not to? I may have done a run through on this with him, so he may have a slight competitive advantage. So if you can have a slippy trigger finger, that would help. He takes it far too seriously. Right, 100 players. Right, is everyone in? Everyone in? You can't win. Let me just be clear. You can't win. All right, thank you. OK, so three questions. TC18 quiz part two. Is this a picture of? Tableau Public, Tableau Prep, Tableau Server, or Tableau Desktop? Nice, easy one for you to start with. Oh, we should throw one out that said Tableau Desktop. It's actually Tableau Server. That's web edit on the server. Yeah. Catches a lot of people out, that one. You can tell there's one slight difference in an icon at the very top left of the screen, but you obviously weren't paying attention. B, where's B? Woo, well done. Banubi, you're still second. You really can't take it this seriously. How many of the sparkles in the Tableau logo are red? One, two, three, or four? How well do we know the Tableau products, right? We've all been here for a week. How many of those sparkles are red? S just the one, the very bottom left sparkle. B, still going? Shorts? Hey, OK. And which version of Tableau was released in line with the 2017 conference in Las Vegas last year? Was it 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, or 10.6? There's the release notes if that helps you in any which way, shape, or form. It was actually 10.4. It got released two weeks before conference last year in September. OK, so we've got B, Ellie, and Shane. If you just guys want to stand up so he can fire a thing at you. OK. Where's B? Oh, B's at the back. Oh, next one. Is that Shane, right? And Ellie, right. You, you can just have yours thrown, because it will take your head off. <laughs> right, if you do that, I'll get, I'll get back on the, uh, on the next one. So we did a test. Tableau has insurance. So just to, as an aside, when we tested that last night, the man in the shop said, turn the PSI. You want the PSI to be about 40, OK? So we went, OK, we did 40. What we just launched those at was about four. <laughs> so, so when we did 40 last night, and it was empty, because he said, you've got to fire it empty before you can actually launch it, it sounded like a bomb had gone off in this room, literally. <laughs> we jumped, and we knew we were firing the blooming thing. Anyway, moving back on. OK. See, 10 minutes keeps you awake, keeps everyone up. So I now want to talk to you about a specific problem that we had. If you consider a satisfaction survey with 6,000 respondents, 12 questions, each with the option of leaving a comment, generating over 72,000 comments. Now, in the past, our only option to analyze that was to lock somebody in a room for a whole week to interpret those comments, or an alternative to try speed reading. But it just doesn't work, right? We now use a mixture of artificial intelligence and machine learning. We use a tool set which includes Tableau, Alteryx, and Cogni uh, Microsoft Cognitive Services to provide both translation and sentiment analysis. What took us a week now literally takes minutes. Ability to drive actions from the data more quickly. And we now have two things. We have a score on one side and a commentary on the other. We can ask and answer the question, which is, do they match? The sentiment analysis goes much deeper than the score somebody gives you. We can understand what people are really thinking. We can analyze all of the comments in minutes, explore those key words and those key phrases that are coming out. 
And I'm going to show you the importance of the rich data hidden in that sentiment. Does anyone know what that says? Ah, people do. Oh, I'm very impressed. It's China, written in Chinese. Well done. Well, you've, you've got a cap. Who, who, who else had it at the back? You had your hand up, right? OK. Let's, heads up. Oh, bad for me, little arms. OK, uh, so through AI, we're able to discover a problem when translating from one language to another. So we work in a number of com countries. We, we work with 22 different languages. An issue you might also have if you, if you have to look after surveys. So a question was asked, how dissatisfied people are with the maintenance and cleanliness of restrooms? But when you look at the comments, oh, excuse me. When you look at the comments, they don't really match up with that, right? There's basically ugh, no lounge, no lounge. It's a resting room, to what I can think of. It's the cafe. So it doesn't sound right. It doesn't really match up to what you're expecting, right? So when we look at it, this is the Chinese word for lounge, whilst this is the Chinese word for restroom. The survey question had actually been translated incorrectly. For four years, this survey had been completed, and because nobody could understand the language that it was written in, nobody could understand that the question was wrong. So we're then able to correct the question. The comments now represent the right thing. So if we now look at it, we'll see, there we go. Sanitation cleaning, not in the right place. Bathrooms are sometimes without napkins or dirty. The sanitary condition of the washrooms is not good. And as a result, we're now asking and measuring the right question. And the scores have gone down. But that's all right, because we're getting answers for the correct questions. And we can then do something with that data, rather than an incorrect question using an incorrect data set. So I'll go into Tableau and just show you how that works in the real world. There we go. So this is a satisfaction survey. Again, dummy data, so you won't recognize any of these countries, although I'd love to go to Jamwiki. So this is a summary screen that we get at a global, regional, and country level. But where it really gets interesting is when we start going into the detailed overview. And the spinning wheel stops spinning. If anyone has any tips for cash warming to hold this in there, I'm looking at you, Mark. OK, so we start at the top. We can see the satisfaction that this survey, the change from the previous, and a number of respondents. Then what we have down the right-hand side here is by each question, the satisfaction score, how it's changed from previous surveys. From the most, so safety's gone up 2%, to food and beverage down 6%. Now, normally, you'd look at that and you go, food and beverage is down 6%. That's quite a lot. But actually, we use statistical significance um, modeling to understand whether that is a significant decrease or not. Actually, 6% isn't. Over on this side, we can compare where the scores are actually coming in. And then as we move down, bless you, we can start looking at driver analytics. Remember I said about that when we was going up the uh, predictive method? So when we look at cleanliness, cleanliness has the strongest correlation to the overall satisfaction score that we're getting. Which is interesting, because although cleanliness score isn't that great, it's certainly not the lowest. HVAC would be, which may be where you would naturally go when you're looking at the answers, right? Then we can see the correlations down here. We can see how data's changed over time. And then at the bottom, we can actually see how that correlation is moving, right? So in this instance, the correlation is increasing on cleaning, which tells us that we really need to focus on that in that region and country, because it's becoming more of an issue and a driver. So we fix that, we make people happier. And then the final one in here is this verbatim analysis. All of that rich data and insight that we'd never had before, that was just in there but locked away. We couldn't get to it. So what we have up here is how people responded uh, and the important attributes in driving overall satisfaction. Over here, we have a summary of the comments from people that were satisfied. And here, a summary of the comments from people that were not satisfied. And then at the bottom, if I just scroll down a bit, what we can see is the actual comments that people were writing in the native language. So this example's got Spanish up here, and we can see it in the original, or we can then translate it to English. But the key thing is, all the work's being done in the natural language. So it's not translating it into English and then doing the analysis, where you may get some words and that mixed up. It's doing it in 22 natural uh, languages. So there you go. Right, I've got one more while I'm in Tableau. I'll show you one other demo while we're in here. And this piece of work was all about trying to help with investment decisions that we have 
on our estate. Okay, where should we invest first on renewing our air conditioning assets in Mexico? Sounds a boring topic, but it's absolutely massive and quite critical. So what we have over on the side here is we have every property, again, this is all randomized and anonymized data, so it's not real, uh, real sites and properties. And we wanted to take information from our core systems, external leases, property data, such as looking at the age, the last refurbishment, and the data in the grid is ordered so that the one at the top, basically looking at the ones with the most reds, is the, the uh, site that you should be taking the most amount of focus on. And there's a weighting attribute that can be put to this on each of the measures, asset status, condition, lifespan, and each region might want to look at this differently. So what we've also developed is we have in the Autrix Gallery a simple app that will allow us to adjust the weighting on each of those that will then wrap straight back into Tableau, which is really useful to be able to adjust that. So if we look at an example here, hopefully that clicks on the right one. Yep, so Linfield at the top. We then zoom in on that, that site where it is. We can see it's got five HVAC assets in there. This 100% line is their lifespan of that asset. So all of those assets are, have exceeded the lifespan. But actually that's okay because it's only an estimate, right? How long does a, an air conditioning unit last? It should last 20 years. It's maybe 21, 22 years in, so that's okay. But what we can see is three of those assets over here in pink is showing wear. So we should be considering investment. And actually what we can see at the bottom is, yes, we've got investment planned in both, of, in, uh, both this year and next year in that site, so that's okay. Now, the other example I'm going to show you is Deep Viewy down the bottom. And this little symbol here next to the name indicates that that's a flagship property, so a really keen one. So again, it's got five assets, all of which, again, are over 100%, none of which are really showing where, but then when we look at the investment calendar, we can see there's investment planned, but only in 2021. So what we might want to do is have that conversation with the leadership there and say, you might just want to be bringing that forward because you've got potential risk that your investment is going to, um, that the assets are going to fall over before that time. We want to just bring that forward. Okay. Just get teed up. Sneak peek of something that's coming in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, that's loud when I cough, sorry. And... Is that coming back up? Yeah. And one last demo I'm just going to talk about here. Uh, a storm was brewing, right? There was a mega typhoon that was called Mancoot that was threatening to wreak havoc, damaging buildings and putting people and lives in danger in Asia. So one of the teams scoured the, scoured the web to search for geo data relating to the typhoon and quickly found a complex data set which was in XML. So creating polygons to map the projection of uh, Mancoot using Alteryx, then publishing those up to Mapbox allowed us to refresh that data consistently over the weekend that would then provide our senior leadership team with a consolidated and visual overview of the storm, able to inform those local responses and look at plans to ensure that buildings and people were safe and that damage was fixed fast. So I've talked to you so far about where we are today. I'm now going to talk to you about Project Picard and next generation analytics. No groans, I thought I might get a groan with that. So what we're looking at doing is reducing the need to interact with dashboards by pushing rather than pulling, making it far easier for our frontline staff to make use of the data that we collect, to help them in their working day and reduce and ultimately eliminate the need for data downloading. I hate data downloading. That reduces the risk of error and incorrectly informed decision making providing alternative ways to explore the data. So we're going to be looking next week, next year, to turn uh, WebEdit on for every single person. We can then deploy new technology and best practices wherever it can support our team to enable JOL to walk that future of work story, making sure it's fit for mobile and introducing a new portal. And Jean-Luc approved the plan. So when we look at the data architecture piece of it, we want to move away from SQL coding, move into um, uh, Alteryx workflows that are visual and easy to uh, articulate. And with our data architecture, I'm going to just describe that to you using the medium of Lego, because it's a really good way of explaining it. So if I come down here, you'll see that you start at the bottom, you've got your transactional data sources, right? That is your data. You then might have some stream ETL, uh, batch ETL going into your warehouses, that sorts of data. Then have your data marts, which then starts to arrange that data, and then finally move everything up onto published data sources onto the Tableau server. So we're using TDS files so that we can publish those visually so that when we are then doing web edit, people can bring that data across. 
We're also moving from waterfall to an agile methodology, releasing dashboards consistently and on, on a two-week sprint cycle, using that common data structure that we just looked at. Now, this takes a little bit of getting used to for the team, but once it's in, it's fine and a much better way of building the process. It introduces a formal sign-off process. Does it meet the scope requirements that we had initially? Does it meet our own internal standards? And has the data architecture been documented? We then ensure that the standards are met, allowing us to publish in those sprint cycles, add launches to our wider communication channels, let people know the dashboard's out there, and then educate the users, provide them with training videos, webinars, one-to-one, -one, so that they're not just left in the dark. And actually transforming how our dashboards look with a new, consistent style to our analytics, using our corporate colors, with a consistent flow and placement, definitions embedded in the dashboards, and best practice chart types. Let me just show you what that looks like in Tableau. Okay. So here's our new style guide. This is all written and developed by Simon Beaumont again in the front. So we're going to be looking at the look and feel, a standard approach to designing dashboards, and then reusability. And then the key bit that goes all the way through this is actually we've got a community-inspired area over here of of bits that we can look at, that people can use as a reference to go online and see what's about there. We, we're looking at things like dashboard layout, where the header should be, the footer, where the workbook icon should be, the JOL logo, where that should be. We've got a whole piece on mobile dashboard design, which was kind of made redundant for anyone that was in devs on stage earlier. But you know, the, the principle is right. You still need to look and understand that. So Simon, great work, but never mind. And in color, OK, applying our corporate color palettes to it, so our primary color palettes that we have and our secondary color palettes as well. And then looking at chart types. So for anyone that doesn't know, Andy Creeble, who I referenced earlier, he rebuilt recently the Financial Times visual vocabulary and he built it all in Tableau and he released it to the world. So Simon's been in touch with Andy and he's very kindly allowed us to use it at JOL. So Simon's translated this into the JOL color set and it will help to educate and allow the users to be able to go through and use this and have a reference point. So that's, a, that's kind of the starting point of where we're trying to get to with it. And then... I'll just show you a quick video as well from Steve Jobs to really bring talking about the very down. first iPhone launch. Let me show you some about widgets here. Uh, let's go to stocks right now. And we're going to load stock information off the web. And uh, just right onto the phone here. <coughs> Oh, look, Apple's up. So when he designed the iPhone, Steve Jobs wanted it to look as good on the inside as it did on the outside, even though nobody would ever see it. And that's also our ambition for dashboard design, that we absolutely make the inside of a dashboard look as good as the outside, even though none of the end users will ever see it. So other elements include moving from uh, the old into new includes an interactive portal, natural language capability, predictive analysis, social commentary, right back with extensions, mobile and tablet designs, and a new modern portal for Tableau, which has been designed by Interworks, with personalized content, recommendations, embedded tutorials, global filters, and the ability to export directly into PowerPoint, which, again, may have been made redundant slightly earlier in devs on stage, but hey, they did that before I wrote, after they, I wrote this speech. So let me uh, just show you what that looks like in a minute. So this is what the portal would look like. So it has a view up here where we can be looking at some of our key dashboards, things that we've recently viewed. We can have easy access to our help materials. We can view any of our actual dashboards going in. But if I just go into the dashboard that shows us, oh, logging in, timed out. We can see actually how some of those dashboards are built and, and their, um, uh, how they function when you're in there. So you can have a tutorial that comes up and once it loads. Up the top here, we can go into that tutorial full screen, but there's a couple of nice widgets. So one of them is export as a presentation. So we can see the view here within it. Over here as well is recommendation. So if you set up security and hierarchies correctly within your team, you can look at what your peers and your colleagues are looking at and go into those. And the export into PowerPoint is really nice because actually what you get is that. So you just at a click of a button, you get three tabs, your, your first, your closing, and you'll put that in the middle, okay? Ten minute countdown. Okay. So I'll flick through some of these. So we're looking at natural language, both generation, 
and uh, programming. We're looking at predictive analytics with Python, how that can provide predictive. Social commentary, making better use of the new features of tagging annotation that are coming on the server. And also then looking at something that I know Paul Banu doesn't like, but the power of extensions. So this looks like Super Mario. It's actually a Tableau dashboard with Super Mario built into it using extensions that the team at Infotopics built. OK, so very last quiz. So last chance to win some swag, if you can get that up quickly so we can fly through. Get ready with your gun. OK, so 313-2910, coot.it, 313-2910. Oh, you're getting a lot faster at this, right? <clears throat> okay, so the last three prizes. Okay, last couple of seconds. Okay, three questions, 10 seconds each. Since the launch of 10.4 last year, how many production major releases have Tableau launched? One, two, three, or four? Actually, three releases since then. Ray, where's Ray? Did I pronounce that right? Ah, oh, OK. What is this an image of? <clears throat> is it Tableau Prep, Tableau Visible, Tableau Mobile, or Tableau Beta? It is, in fact, Tableau Visible, still very close to my heart. Josh? Hey. There he is. How many products have Tableau launched over the years? Now, when we talk about a product, it's desktop, server, reader, online. Seven, eight, nine, or 10? Oh, closely distributed, but it's actually nine products. OK, so on the podium, ah, Jesse M. OK, so Jesse's down here. Then we've got Marky uh, down the front. And Seb, where's Seb? Ah, OK, you guys, OK. So we got that. Jess, stand up. <laughs> You're getting good at that, Aaron, right? OK. Uh, oh, well, you can just fire one out while I'm going through this. OK. So <laughs> I'm just going to show a demo of beta now. So this isn't related to JWall, but I have a passion for mapping, especially airline data based on the data from an anonymous orange UK-based airline that I maybe used to work for. And here's a, just a quick short video of me presenting when I worked for them at TC15. And what you need to watch out for is the lady just at the, at the side oh, here. OK, you watch that lady. I'll Take show you a life here. jacket from under your seat, put it over your watch head, her. okay. and, inflate the to and inflate the life jacket by pulling this toggle really hard. <laughs> I still owe her a beer for that. OK. Uh, right, so let me flick into Tableau. Now, this is proper Tableau. I've got to build a dashboard. And a lot of people don't think I can even do this. But yeah, now I've got, got some doubters in the front row. Huh? We've already made a play about you using Tableau. Yeah. OK. Right, so here's an original dashboard. Let me just press play, and I'll just start talking you through this. OK, so what we're looking at here is a single day across two weeks. On the left-hand side, visualization is a normal day. On the right-hand side is when the French air traffic control team, which looks after this country here, goes on strike. And you can see the distribution of the aircraft have to fly a bit differently, right, to try and understand where they are and where they're going. It's really interesting to see, but it doesn't help you get to the insight of, well, where are those flight paths and where are they going? When we then move on and use the density chart, what we can start to see is some real, actually, let me use that, might be easier is to start to understand over here, where are the hotspots? Where are we really flying those aircraft through? And can we look at making adjustments to those compared to where they would have been normally coming through the line? And the other thing we can do is uh, look at density levels and, and look at how that distributes across. And from an airline point, what's really useful is actually when we get down to the airport. So looking at how you move around the runways, it's really important. Are you taxiing for a long time? And then the final bit is the stands where you park. Are you parking on an evenly distributed stand? Which actually this one is, which is really good. And then let me just go into a sheet and just then show you how that works. Okay, so if I bring time of flight up here, 
She's going to record this because no one's ever seen me using Tableau. Uh, right, so I'm looking at the time and date. I need to just put a filter on as well because I don't want everything in there. So I just want two days as an example. And then if I bring in lat and long, Okay, what I start to get is a view of all of them. So it's a bit busy though, right? So I can make it a bit smaller to see, but still quite hard, okay? That would be a normal chart. By just going down and using the density mark type though, you should then be able to see where your hotspots are, where the routes are going. And the really clever thing with density is that if you keep zooming in, it will keep resizing for you. And you can then start to see what's going on. So it's a really useful tool that's gonna get released on uh, Monday, I believe. Okay. <coughs> okay. Last bit. And I begin to sync. Okay, I was gonna show you an alpha demo, um, but I wasn't allowed to by Tableau, so I can't tell you anything about what it might be, but there's a clue as to what it might be. So I talked to you, I said I was gonna take you through 177 slides. Uh, these are some credits. I have to give a shout out to Matt Francis, who is a master of this presentation style. Um, as I said earlier, please look at completing the survey on your app. So hopefully you found this okay. Um, and if you did so, please give some feedback. And just before I go, another Apple reference. I've got one more thing. I commissioned a video to tell our team story, which I would like to just share with you now. Come on. she is. <clears throat> the business intelligence and technology team are a vital part of the JLL HSBC partnership, providing us with actionable insights through informed analysis. The business intelligence and technology team are at the leading edge of advanced technology using powerful analytics that we benefit from every day. Their partnering helps us all to see and understand the data at our fingertips. Data analytics really is the jewel in the crown of the account. The business intelligence and technology team strives to help people see and understand their data through being the smartest when it comes to data, insights and technology. I am extremely proud of the innovation the team has delivered through investment in people and technology. Our biggest strength is the team. Partnering with our client and the business, we've delivered multi-million dollar benefit through transforming data into actionable insights driving performance through improving compliance, reducing cost, increasing productivity, and delivering revenue. Well done, Simon, for pulling that together. Thank you.
And, and with that, that's the end of the, the session. So thank you all very much. Thanks very much for coming along. Cheers.